successively from three sides to approach us. And as long as this continues until we're a desert, we're not we're going to have fires. That's that's just it. So I think this is a long, long term effort that's going to have to start if it hasn't already. Hello, I'm Ben. Ben Edgar, designer, board member, friend and fan of Reese Cooper. We have three people on today that we're going to be interviewing in regards to Reese Cooper's upcoming show. Danya, Southern California Program Manager at the National Forest Foundation. Tom, Executive Director at the Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California. And of course, Reese Cooper, Founder and Creative Director of Reese Cooper. Also, you have a show coming up, Pyrophyte, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, on January 23rd. And today we're just taking this slot to talk a little bit about Reese's focus beyond just clothing, beyond just the fashion show, and a little bit more into these partnerships he's developed with these two people that are on the call and their vision around what he's doing as well and how they've helped. So my first question to kick it off, this one's going to you, Reese, is sustainability is getting thrown around perhaps a bit too much in fashion lately. I mean, it's a good thing uh, for better or worse, but but Reese, you spend a lot of time and energy ensuring that your, that your products themselves are made as sustainably as possible, but you're also spending a lot of energy and profit at this point uh, donating to, in this instance, National Forest Foundation and some other partners can you talk a little bit about the difference between giving visibility uh, and, and doing some donations and working the best you can on your clothing being sustainable and then actually working directly with these partnerships and developing long-term relationships? Yeah, there's, uh, it, it's actually pretty two different paths. So doing clothing itself sustainably is its own beast. It's its own challenge and we're, growing our efforts in that and doing the best we can, such as all the efforts we have with using dead stock fabrics, organic dyeing processes, mm -hmm. our denim washes, things like that, just to make sure if we are going to be producing stuff, because this is the platform we have that we're doing it in the, I guess, cleanest way we can. Uh, the efforts that go towards the, uh, everything else we have going on, it's more bigger picture. Like the clothing is very specific uh, and mm -hmm. it's not things that everyone will understand or can participate in, but everything else, uh, it, it kind of stems from the fact that it's, it comes from my curiosity. For instance, the observatory, I did not know that it was runoff donations. Uh, I truthfully had no idea when I first connected with you guys. Uh, and being in the position I have, uh, or the position that I'm in, <clears throat> it feels more of like an obligation versus uh, like, it's something fun for me to do, but it also feels like it's the right thing to do. I don't want to do a show talking about certain things, uh, showing things in the forest without doing something with National Forest Foundation or doing the observatory without finding a way uh, to help bring attention over to you guys. And that's why like, the, the product we're releasing on show day <clears throat> with the uh, proceeds going to both of you guys, it's instead of me creating more product and printing some stuff uh, and using that money for me to create those products on my own and my own production timelines and my own production methods, it would be really expensive stuff just inherently as it is. And there's no need for me to create more hoodies right this moment when there's companies like champion where you can just print on blanks of things that already right. exist uh that have probably been sat in a warehouse for a year uh and it makes the price point far more accessible like your entry level to being able to support one of these causes is now like a 50 dollars t-shirt or 120 dollars hoodie trying to just make that range as accessible as possible and if you don't like the hoodies or t-shirts we encourage people to donate directly mm -hmm. if if they found the show inspiring or did a little bit of research uh, on their own afterwards. I think, yeah, it's interesting because I mean, fashion is ultimately about storytelling. We could all wear the same clothes every single day, but we choose to express ourselves through these clothes and things like that and find something that we identify with. And it's funny because what you're doing is you're basically taking the storytelling and instead of stopping it there, you're kind of moving it into yeah, more of a reality with the nation. Continue with everything uh, brand wide, like the overall, brand ethos is very based in uh, outdoors and keeping things relatively in nature, especially Southern California. Uh, and so we've been building things like our 1% for the planet. We're working with One Tree Planted and National Forest Foundation and things like that. So it's uh, it, it goes deeper than just 
what's the next show? What are we going to talk about next? And we try to continue those things long after the clothes are gone. Yeah, and that's actually a good segue into my next question for Danya. In regards to NFF, um, for fashion consumers, the story of donation and philanthropy often stops uh, with the brand giving money. And like, that's it. It kind of goes into a black hole. They never get to meet you. Uh, they don't get to learn a little bit more about what you're doing. In fact, sometimes people have joked that it's kind of a sin tax that they're paying. They're saying, we're fashion, we're kind of horrible. Uh, we'll kind of cover up some of the things we've done by by um, giving you some money, but we're not really going to talk about you. So I kind of my question was around um, uh, what impact does gaining visibility play compared with simply receiving funds to move your mission forward? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think, Reese, you started pulling that together. It's about the importance of a legacy. You know, I, that's part of what public lands are all about, right? What's the legacy of the indigenous communities that live here, of the people who live in the foothills of the mountains. And this kind of effort beyond, like you said, giving donations really pulls all of that together. And don't get me wrong, donations are really important. You know, we need funds to get the work done on the ground. But I think what Reese and his team is trying to do is amplify that. You know, I think I was talking to the team and it's like, oh, we can cut a check or we can have, you know, hundreds or thousands of people learn about the mission of the National Forest Foundation, learn about the Mount Wilson Observatory, learn about the mountains in Southern California. And that's so valuable to us, having eyes on what we do and why these areas are important. Um, you know, having a name of a show like Pyrofight connected to these natural processes that um, have it, have wildfire become so complicated in the life and culture of Southern California and California um, across the state. And I think, you know, for us, per partnering with a brand like, like Reese Cooper is bridging all those gaps. You know, what does conservation mean to business? How does that connect to art? How does that connect to the community? And I feel like this is exactly the kind of partnership we've been looking for to bridge all of those gaps. There's also, I found there's something really charming about the fact that Reese is uh, either promoting people getting out there, whether it's the Mount Hood Observatory or some of the things in your space. And typically fashion is a world you kind of can't enter. It's not really, the shows are not for the consumer, the shows are for the select few. But I mean, in reality, people could actually go visit and participate in some of the locations that you've actually hosted your shows at. I find that to be um, really kind of charming in a way and really honest. And, and, and in a sense, that kind of leads into my next one with, with Tom. The Mount Wilson Observatory is a pretty special place with an immense amount of history. We we're actually talking a little bit about it before the call. Some very serious scientific work has happened there over the past uh, decades. Um, the Bobcat wildfires kind of affected you guys in, in more than a more than a serious way. I'm not sure how we can really kind of downplay that. And those were pretty recent. Um, you're still closed to the public. How does hosting a fashion show on your grounds benefit your mission, even while being closed to the public? Well, I I would have never thought of that in a million years to have a fashion show <laughs> up there uh, that that's completely out of the blue and it was it was fantastic uh, um, the forest service approached us about the concept and I said well I I've done about 40 productions up here small and large but I've never done a fashion show and if it benefits the forest service and and coincidentally benefits the observatory I'm I'm all for it so I, I was happy to do it and, and uh, to witness it uh, in production was was really a treat. That's that was worth the price of admission right there. I, I mean, Tom, you saw our facial expressions when we walked in on that first day that you showed us around. It was uh, it was crazy. Uh, I immediately knew this is where I wanted to capture everything. Uh, but to give context to the location, we start out at uh, I think it's E is the name of the telescope over there. That section. It's more of like the outside grounds. Uh, and then we, of course, come across the bridge to the entrance of the observatory. Uh, just trying to give context to the location. And for me, what's so interesting is you can almost look at angle comparisons. Like you see the shots that we're going for uh, on our cameras, and then you can look at fires, uh, photos of the fires back in September and mm -hmm. put them side by side and just be like, oh, that's the building from this photo. Like. In that picture, Tom, that you sent us of the the plane jump dumping the FOSS check, that was actually the first location that we used for the show. You can see the path already carved out right there. Yeah, there's something about it being actually in the news and being a real place that you saw perhaps in not such a great light in a terrible situation happening, and now you kind of hopefully putting a good light on it. Uh, Reese, so um, the nature preservation, uh, philanthropy around all of that, 
the whole idea of being outdoors is like pretty much woven into the fabric, no pun intended, of your of your company. And now you've got, <laughs> I'm sorry, now you have this like massive platform that you've been growing. Well, I didn't mean it as a joke, but now you have this like incredibly large platform that you've grown. Uh, the LA Times article came out today that's highlighting both of the missions uh, that we're covering here today. But my question is, so great, you've got this platform, you're really young, you've earned this whole thing. How do we help other people who who don't aspire to have a platform like yours, uh, are working to get to a platform like yours, what can they do in their daily lives? Actually, it's really a question for everyone. What can they do in their daily lives um, to, to follow a similar mission to yours with kind of small uh, impact things they can do? I, I guess the, the main thing on my end would be if, for instance, if you have a platform in any shape or form, I think it comes down to the fact of having a large platform, it allows me to reach a lot of people uh, and once you find something interesting, or once I find something interesting, all I want to do is talk about it. So I'm in a fortunate mm -hmm. enough position where I get to share it with however many people come across it when we put things out publicly. But you also have a platform as an individual, you probably know about 10, 30 people that will listen to what you have to say. Uh, anyone can. Uh, and so for me, it's all it is, the main thing you can do, say you don't have uh, the financial means to start running around donating to places or you don't have the time uh, or abilities to be volunteering. One of the main things it, that's important you can be doing is actually just sitting there and educating yourself. And then you'll probably end up, if you're anything like me, you'll end up in a little bit of a research hole uh, in discovering all these things that are actually somewhat interesting and exciting. And you're going to talk about them. And that's the most important thing you can do. Say you have no platform or no way to go out and physically help at least learn about it. So next time you are outside, you understand what you're dealing with a little bit better. I guess maybe I'm the poster child for, for volunteerism. Uh, I've, been, I've been a volunteer at the observatory for all, about 20 years now, um, as a telescope operator, as a trainer for the instruments, uh, and for the past six years as the executive director. And so I, I'm pleased to, uh, put all my effort, spare time, uh, more than my spare time into the observatory, its management and development. Uh, and well, I guess the reason I do this and, and the observatory is a very special place. I'm not unique at the observatory. We, we run on volunteers. That's what keeps us going. Engineering, uh, construction people, electricians, plumbers, uh, volunteer their services to keep the place running and, and even improve it. Um, but we do this for the, just for the sole purpose of sharing this facility, its, its history, and improving its future with people. So uh, we have a lot of people uh, come up there. We did a measurement one year. We had 77,000 visitors in, wow. in one year, which, which is quite a bit. We had, it surprised us too. Uh, but we like that personal contact with people that, who are uh, you know, some students, some retirees, uh, all walks of life who come in there and don't even know the place existed and, and find out what a wonderful place it, it is. And um, we love to share that. We enjoy sharing that experience and just watching them, watching their expressions. So that's, that's my, my, uh, my pleasure in, in doing this. I think a lot of it has already been said. And I think um, having been to the Mount Wilson Observatory, I'm very appreciative of Tom and the other group, uh, the other volunteers, because uh, it's such a beautiful place. But Tom, um, you know, represents so many volunteers that have been working out here in Southern California on our public lands for, in some cases, decades, as Tom said. So, you know, we have a really, a, a really dedicated community to protecting our public lands. Um, so that's certainly one way to get involved. Um, like Reese said, you know, it's we're we're in hard times right now. So donating with your money is might not might not be for everybody. So you know, finding some volunteer opportunities is a really great way to get involved. The pandemic has made that a little tricky, so you have to get a little bit creative. And I know some folks have tried have tried to find ways to engage volunteers virtually. So there's some research you could do. Um, but just go out there and enjoy your local national forest, your public lands. Um, the national forest system has something for everyone, you know, no matter what you're interested or how you interested in or how you decide or choose to engage and connect with nature. Um, but the important thing is, as we said, is to educate yourself. You know, there's, there's a lot, we see a lot of it right now in terms of, you know, 
wildfires started by people, you know, people who were just behaving innocently because they didn't really know better. Um, or we see that our public lands are, you know, there's a lot of trash, there's a lot of waste. And so just doing your part as an individual going and enjoying nature and bringing your trash out with you, staying on the trail, really simple things that all of us can do that, you know, if we all collectively engage in these behaviors can make a huge difference. So um, as we said, you know, we all have a role to play here. Um, and so just finding that niche that works for you. And if it's as small as just engaging it with nature in a really safe way, that's a really massive impact. So um, yeah, uh, definitely like it's like been said, do your research and get out there. I think, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, and I know outdoor just general outdoor activity has increased over the past 12 months because there's kind of nothing else to do and it's a fairly safe activity to do. But with that, it is fairly important to get educated. But even as simple as sharing kind of a, an Instagram that you're out, you know, on a deeper hike into somewhere is its own form of sharing uh, kind of the story of what's going on. I think that's important. Um, this is lastly, this is kind of for everybody. Um, after an incredibly challenging uh, and scattered 12 months, although it looks like we're on the tail end of this, uh, the hope is that some lessons have been learned. Um, both, I mean, we've got a lot of things politically, uh, societally, and all those kinds of things, but now with nature preservation and sometimes took a back seat to some things um, while we were working through a really challenging past year, uh, where would the three of you like to see forest and nature preservation and fashion's involvement in these movements in the next five years? Right now, the, the Forest Service, uh, in, in taking a very conservative approach to, to forest management, is, uh, is uh, attempting to keep the forest closed uh, till 2022 to um, interior trails uh, and some of the roads and some of the roads that uh, lead to the observatory. So we, we're going to approach them uh, to see if we can allow visitors maybe as early as this summer to come up to the observatory on a road that's currently closed and, and maybe closed for an additional year. Uh, because we're, we're figuring that if this pandemic lifts, uh, people are going to go crazy for some place to go. And, and uh, the observatory is, is excellent. It's safe, uh, it's accommodating, it's fascinating. Uh, it's, and we can, we can handle people up there. So we're going to approach them and say that uh, this may be the one safe destination you have in the Angeles National Forest uh, for, for the public. So we, we would like to get access um, in this process back to the public as quickly as possible. That's, that's my goal anyway. That, that's one of the, the things I'm most hopeful about is the show. Half of the people I've told where I'm doing this, most people didn't know that you could even go up there in the first place and never had thought to try. So if this, hopefully I, I think Andre uh, and I did a pretty good job at highlighting this place in a beautiful way to the point where people will hopefully want to come check it out. Yeah, I think what you all just said is kind of key to what I was hoping for. You know, it's always more people can some can bring in some negative consequences, but that's not our goal here. We want as many people to enjoy these public lands to go to and, and witness and experience Mount Wilson Observatory. So I really hope that um, you know, this, this engagement with our national forest really keeps up. Um, I think the other thing that I was thinking of, you know, in the next five years, thinking of, as Tom said, you know, what the future looks like of the Bobcat fire burn area. I hope we're able to take action a bit more quickly than we have in the past to restore this area and open up places so that we keep these recreation areas open. Um, we are the last big fire it was bigger than the Bobcat fire, the station fire that happened in 2009. We're still recovering from that. So I'm hoping we can shorten that recovery window if we can. And I think one of the ways that we do that is through these types of partnerships. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for what the next five years look like. And Reese, my kind of final thing is, and I'm gonna put you on the spot. So you've done, you've done shows in Paris and now there's this kind of conversation that, um, and this is an interesting context even to be talking about this where this is gonna be streamed that these are gonna look different for a while, even after there's a vaccine and even after there's all that, this has been pretty disruptive to like a you know, decades old, if not centuries old kind of tradition. Do you, I mean, do you think you're gonna to continue to be doing outdoor shows and, and videos and films and things like this? Uh, <clears throat> personally, I, I hope so. I, I think for me, the first show that we did in Paris uh, was an incredible opportunity just to be 
welcomed into the city like that. However, at the end of the day, we went into Pali to Tokyo, the, the museum in the city, and we put down a fake trail. I was going to say, there's an irony in what in the show that you yeah. did and the show that you had planned that you didn't do last year was that they were all recreations of the outdoors inside. Yes. And so now that we're, uh, the, I mean, the silver lining is like, yes, we can't go to Paris. However, we're now in a position to actually shoot and capture the things that we were trying to fake originally. I mean, my most hopeful outcome in the next couple of years is as we get to do these things more and more and they get bigger and better, we kind of stay <clears throat> over here for at least some of them, uh, find ways to participate in Paris in our own new way. As we're going to see, there's plenty of disruptions in the industry right now. I don't think anyone knows how to bring it back mm -hmm. to what it was, uh, or even if it should go back to what it was. I think this is like right. plenty of opportunity for like a rebirth of uh, what everything looks like. Uh, but as these things get bigger and hopefully once we come to the other side of COVID, we could start bringing more people out to these things. Like I was gonna ask, would you ever open them say, up to the public? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Say five years, maybe not even five years, say three years from now, we wanted to do another show on forest land in California. The, the goal there is to make it open to anyone who is willing to drive there. Mm -hmm. Instead of their- yeah, instead of your PR 300 person at the door list, it just if you're willing well, to yeah, drive here, for, you're meant to be here. And for people who've attended so many fashion shows, it's like you experience the fashion show and then you immediately are leaving as a buyer to go to the next one. There's something I think kind of romantic about sticking around the space afterwards, perhaps having a bit of community, interacting with people, learning yeah. about the Mount Hood observatories, going for a hike, making an entire weekend potentially out of it in the outdoors sounds to me a little bit exactly. less stressful than, than the Paris Fashion Week run. Yeah, we'll see. All right, well, thank you guys. This was really fun.